This is Sterling March, and you are tuned into Kingdom Road with yours truly, where we teach the correct interpretation of the Kingdom of God. Correct because what is taught is not always correct. But this is a place of knowledge where we do our best to communicate to you what God has instructed according to the interpretation that He has given to us through His Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, not everybody in a pulpit, not everybody on a video, is being led of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I'm here to try to correct some things that have been taught and to provide the information that will give you the truth. Remember Jesus said, I am the truth, the truth, and He is my Savior. And I pray that He is yours too, and if He's not, I'm, gl I'm especially glad that you're here. Because what I'm about to teach is information that will take you a little step further, another step further towards having the truth. And his name is Jesus. So I thank you for being here with me today. I want to ask you always to share. Please share these teachings. Help someone to know God. Help someone to know the truth. Give them the knowledge needed. It's all about knowledge. You know, we can have as much emotion as we want to when it comes to God. But this is not about emotion. It's not about emotion. Unfortunately, most people who are claiming God are approaching Him from an emotional perspective. This isn't about emotion. It's about knowledge. You must know who God is, what He did, why He did what He did. And once you know that, even salvation itself requires knowledge. You must know why Jesus did what he did in the way that he did. So that when you receive him, you receive him because of that knowledge. Not because it's a popular thing. Or because you're hurting some emotional response to him. No, it, can't, it, it cannot be an emotional response. There's nothing wrong with you having an emotional, some emotion when it comes with knowledge. But emotion without knowledge is useless. And I want to give you that knowledge. Okay. Today our subject matter will be sin, the greatest mistake ever made on earth. Yes, indeed. It was a mistake. It was a mistake on the part of man. Let me put it that way. And I will explain that to you. And I know you, 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 I got you interested now. I know you, <laughs> you want to hear what this is about, Bill. Please stay with me. Stay with me. Okay? And like I said again, please share these teachings. Share it with everybody you know. Okay? Even your pastor. Even your pastor. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody can use a little bit of enlightenment. I get enlightened. I have teachers that I, I tune into. Okay? So thank you again for being here with me. We're going to have a good time today. And hopefully by the end of this teaching, you will have a better understanding of what sin is and, and, and why it caused what it caused. Okay, so let's go right into it. And by the way, these teachings will be posted right here. Okay, so you can always go back and watch it. And it will, it will all, always also be on YouTube on my channel, Sterling March. Check the spelling. And on t my Twitter account, which is uh, I don't know how to how to, how, to, how you pronounce the name is an X, so you gotta help me with that. But um, it's it's also there, okay? It's gonna be there. I'm gonna post it there immediately after I'm through, okay? So thank you again for being with me today. God bless your day so far. So let's go. Sin, the greatest mistake ever made on earth. There's one thing that every human being does, and one of the most frequent things that we all do. It is one of the most common occurrences on earth, and affects this planet like nothing else can or ever will. God gave many commands concerning its occurrence in the Old Testament, and even under grace through His Son in the New Testament. Commands that affect our everyday lives. That occurrence is sin. Sin. Sin is so devastating in its ability to decide our future that God Himself left heaven to address it. That's how 
devastating sin was. God had to come to earth to deal with this. And that's how important you are to him. It is so powerful in its effect that it required his death to counteract it. And it all started with a mistake. It required a God to counteract it, listen, because only a human without sin, which is a God, can reverse the curse of a human with sin, which is a dead or fallen God, while simultaneously giving the power to resist what causes it, and that is the nature of sin, which by definition is man's inclination to do wrong over right if given the choice. Let me give you the definition of nature of sin again. Man's inclination to do wrong over right if you give him the choice. So, one of the first things God gave man was choice. He told him in this garden, as a tree of knowledge of good and evil, in this garden, there's a tree of life. I don't want you to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the tree of life is free for you to eat. Now, when you make the initial choice to choose between these two trees, it will determine your existence forever. We know the choice that was made, he chose the wrong tree which produced death instead of choosing the tree which would have given him life. Amazing. Amazing. And he made the choice that has put all of us in a state where we needed God to come to earth to die for us. Keep listening. And by the way, when I say it required a God to counteract it because only a human without sin, which is a God, listen, God made man in his image and in his likeness, just like him, by breathing into this thing he made from the earth, which was simply the container of the man. It was not the man. It was the container of man. Jesus said, ye are gods, but ye will die like men. If he says we will die like men, that means we are not men. We are gods. Okay. But when Adam committed the transgression, the God in him, some say died, some say it left him, some say it caused a separation that caused the God in him to just go dormant. But ever since Adam, all men are born as men instead of as gods as he was originally created to be and that's why jesus said you are gods but you will die like men because you don't know who you are that's what he said he said they know not neither do they understand psalm 82 5 to 7. they know not neither do they understand this is what he said about us now this is what the king said about us he said, they walk on in darkness, meaning ignorance. He said, I have said, he said, and because of it, the whole earth is out of course, meaning that the whole earth is cursed, because you don't know who you are. He said, I have said, ye are gods. When did he say we are gods? When he said in his word, let us make man like us. He said, I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. He said, but you will die like men. And fall like one of the princes, meaning Satan and his angels. Now, if God says you're going to die like a man, that means you are not a man. You are a God, but you're going to die like a man if you don't find your way to him. If we don't find our way to him. And that's why I said... Only a, a human without sin is a God. Because before Adam committed the transgression, he was just like his creator, made in, his, in the image and likeness of his creator, who is God. 
Amazing, huh? So, but how did this sinful predicament begin? Who caused this? Romans 5 and 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So because Adam committed the sin and he was the first man, and because he had the Spirit of God in him, making him a God, like I said, man is who he was in. This is man. This is not who we are. We are in this. Okay? God breathed his son into the thing he had made. The Bible says that Adam was the son of God. Okay? So, like I say, this statement implies that since Adam, all mankind has been born dead because of sin. Let me read it for you again. Romans 5 and 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we are all born dead. Dead, which simply means separation from God. It's not physical death. But the thing is, is that physical death has physical life sorry has a limitation it has a finite end it doesn't last forever but we were created to live forever that's why when Jesus said ye are gods but you will die like men what he was saying was instead of being gods and living forever and having eternity eternal life you will die like men that have no eternal life Unless you find your way to me, he was saying. Okay? So, if man was never born, he could never die. What do I mean? Well, the Bible says we were in God before the foundation of the world. And thus alive before we were actually born on earth. But since Adam, who was the original man, committed sin, which has death inherent in it, Sin, sin and death go hand in hand. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. They go hand in hand, okay? As, as, as long as the sin is present, death is also present. So, all mankind, which, like I say, since the original man committed sin, which has death inherent in it, all mankind is born dead straight from the womb. Okay? Thus, the moment we are born, we die. That's why I said, if we were never born, we could never die. Sounds crazy, right? But like I say, we were in God before the foundation of the world, which means we, we didn't come into existence when God created the thing he made out of the earth. The humus figure. We were in God before that. When he breathed into the thing he had made, he was breathing the thing that existed long before the thing he made from the earth. That was us. We were in him before the foundation of the world, the Bible says. Okay, so we are not men. We are in a man body. But we will die like a man because we don't have, we're not gods unless we find our way to Christ. Christ makes us God again. What did he say? For any man that receives me, I give the power to become a son of God again. Okay, and that's what he wants to do. And so, you will not die like men if you receive Jesus Christ. You will live forever as a God. Okay. Why you don't hear this in teach being taught in church? It's because, you know, I don't like to say this, but I have to. Not everybody on a pulpit is teaching correct doctrine. Jesus said they teach for doctrine the commandments of men, meaning they're teaching their opinion and calling it my doctrine. Even though they got the Bible open. You know what Jesus is saying? Saying they won't see and hearing they won't hear? 
He's saying just because a person is looking in a book doesn't mean they understand what they're saying. Remember the eunuch? When he was asked, understand this what thou readest, he was reading scripture. But he didn't understand what he was reading. So, I think it was um, Timothy who had to teach him what the word meant. Was it Timothy? I think it was. But you know the story. So, well, uh, okay. Because of the era of one man, the history of mankind was forever altered Though God had his mighty hand in the entire incident and had his plan positioned to begin unraveling. Yeah. The entire incident, Eden incident, was orchestrated by God himself as part of his plan for the rebirth of man to Godship through devotion to him. Okay. See, we have to understand, God is in control. He does things to cause man to make decisions. But he gives man clues if man will just allow him to overtake his mind, he will understand those clues. He helps man to understand what choices he, what he should make. He tells man the choices are there, but here's what I want you to choose. But oftentimes, more often than not, we don't listen to God. We go to the humanity in us, which we call, which we call common sense. But like they say, common sense ain't common, because if we had common sense, real common sense, we would know better than to depend on ourselves for our understanding. We would not lean to ourselves. Lean to our Creator. The one who made us, who knows everything about us. Okay? Romans 5 and 15 says, But not as the offense, meaning Adam's transgression, so also is the free gift, meaning Christ. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, see, I keep telling you all. We died when Adam sinned. All his offspring were born dead. So, as, so far, through the offense of one, many be dead. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. In other words, just how Adam's sin caused all of us to die, to be born dead, Jesus Christ coming into the world and giving his life brought life made life not physical life eternal life available to all mankind anyone who will receive him that was always his desire that all of us all his creation and that's all mankind be with him and it's still his desire today I don't care what you've done, what you may have said, what action you, you've taken to, to, to hurt somebody. You can repent of all of that. You can come to Christ right now and he will receive you. I've said it before. I'll say it again. God does not send human beings to hell. He has made available to us a way of coming to him where he wants us to be, where we belong. What did I say earlier? You are all children of the Most High. We are all children of the Most High. But we, by our own decision and choice, choose hell. Maybe inadvertently, but see, that's why you have to have knowledge. You must know what this thing is about, what this life is about, what this is given for. This life on earth is only given for one reason. This three score and ten 
and that is to make a choice between life and death. So, the Christ was not an after, afterthought of God, okay, of the Father. Everything that happened in Eden was foreknown, orchestrated, and prepared for. So, what God was doing was God was putting before us an occasion to be alive forever in him or to, or to be dead forever in him. which is not um, physical death because we are spirits okay like I told you this body is only what we are in this is not who we are so we, we, we never die we live forever anyway but to die as a man means that you live forever in hell that's what happens to men who die in order for you to go to the kingdom, you must be a God again. Listen, that's the difference between heaven and hell. Being a God or being a man. Jesus gives us the opportunity to be gods again. And he says, unless you are a God again, by receiving me as your Lord and Savior, and living according to what I have said, I've instructed you will die as a man which is a God still but without life a dead God see don't let it confuse you what I just said okay I know I said either you will you you're a God but you will die like a man see when he says you're a God but you will die like a man what he is saying is you we, you're still a God you see, once God made it, that declaration, let us make man in our image and likeness, that could not be stopped. All men are still gods. Like I said, Christ, Jesus Christ said, ye are gods. He didn't say ye were gods. He said, ye are gods. But because of Adam's transgression, you are now a dead God. A dead God is a man. You understand? But a God alive, a man who is alive in Christ is a God. So a, a alive in Christ means that you are a God. If you are not alive in Christ as we are all born, we are dead gods, which is a man. <laughs> I know that's kind of complicated, but play it again. Listen to it again. It'll, it'll let it sink in. Okay, so sin unredeemed by the Christ is the deciding factor between the kingdom of heaven and hell. You see, all men sin, but all ain't going to hell. All men sin, but all are not going to hell. Some know the antidote, which is Christ. That's the only difference, and that's the only difference that's needed. It is the greatest deciding factor of mankind's fate, Christ, and he and his creator are responsible for sin, sorry, and sin is the greatest deciding factor of mankind's fate, and he and his creator are responsible for his existence in his, exi in his, in his existence. Sin exists because of a decision by man and God. God gave man the ultimate choice between life and death and placed certain catalysts in place to influence his decision but it was still man's choice nevertheless see God didn't have to put that tree there and he didn't have to put the tree of life there but he put both trees there the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from which he said do not eat or it will cause your death you will that you will no longer be a living God remember the Bible says when God breathed into Adam he became a living soul a living God so God told him, if you eat from this tree, that living soul will die. The physical man still lived. You remember, Adam still lived to be almost a thousand years old. The man didn't die. 
I mean, the man died eventually because human flesh dies eventually, and it goes back to the to the dust. But the the God did the God died immediately, and Adam became just a man, a dead, which is a dead God. It's a it's I know it's a it's a it's a complex configuration, but yeah this this listen i've had to study this over and over and over and over to get this and you got you have to too you have to do the work okay you got to listen to this play this over and over it's important that you get this and if you play it enough you will get it i promise you you'll get it god will help you so he would place life in man by breathing it into him and then gave him a choice to lose it or keep it for all eternity now, this is what he said to the Israelites, okay? He said in Deuteronomy 30 and 15, see, I have said before thee this day, life and good and death and evil. He was saying to them, I, me, I have put before you life and death, good and evil. And I am saying to you, choose. That's what I've given you this three score and ten for that's the only reason you have this, to choose which one you will have. And he was, that counsel was given to the Israelites in the wilderness, but it was first given to Adam and Eve in Eden in a different yet very similar way. God told Adam, if you eat from the forbidden tree, you shall die. In the garden was another tree, an unforbidden tree, a tree from which he could eat, the tree of life. He chose the tree of death, which was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Actually, he didn't choose it. He didn't choose it. He made a great mistake in eating that fruit. One tree that brought death and one tree that gives eternal life. Remember Jesus said, I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But that's what that tree was. That was Jesus offering himself to Adam for immortality. And notice God never told him he couldn't eat from that tree. Okay. So, man chose death through sin. Okay. He chose death through sin, but he didn't choose to sin. He sinned by mistake. The most powerful catalyst in the life of a human is sin because it determines the kind of life we have and the kind of death. Like I said, ultimate life is forever. That's the life of a God, eternal life. Okay? And ultimate death is forever. Meaning, hell. The Bible says, in, in, in hell, your worm never dies. Meaning, your life, the, the, the life force of a spirit can never die. It's a spiritual existence. And spirits never die. That's why, that's why Satan still exists today. God could have, if God could have destroyed him, God would have destroyed him. But, 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 but to God, death for a spirit is hell. And that's where he said he will cast Satan and those who follow him. So, the Bible says that all men sin. Okay, all of us sin. And that there is no, not one who lives that does not. Romans 3 and 23 says, for all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. All. I don't want you to believe because you receive Jesus Christ that you don't sin. Jesus never said you will never sin again. Even the righteous still sin. Ecclesiastes 7 20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Even the righteous still sin. 
that is the enormity and the amazingnessnessnessness of the gift of Jesus Christ. That even the righteous still sin, but yet the righteous will not go to hell. I tell you, all men sin, but all ain't going to hell. That's how awesome God is. And that's how much he loves us. He made that sacrifice because he loves the whole world. He doesn't want any to go to hell. I told you he doesn't send people to hell. He's, he, he, he came and gave his life so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. But the choice is still yours. It, it's all yours. What did he say to the Israelites? Choose. See, I have said, you know, Army 30 and 15. See, I have said before thee this day, life and good and death and evil. He was telling them, see, I've given you laws for you to obey. As long as you obey these laws, you will have life. But if you don't obey these laws, you will have death. It's as simple as that. And he's still saying that same thing today. So, unless of course you, you sorry, you may be the kindest, nicest, most loving person in the world. But you are still not free from the bondage of sin. Sin has nothing to do with how good of a person you are. Because you are not in control of who you are. You are not in control. That's why Jesus said, give control of you to me. Because what I can do in you, you cannot do for yourself. I told you, the, the nature of sin by definition is man's inclination to do wrong over right if you give him the choice. That's the nature of sin. He doesn't have, he, he's under the bondage, the slavery. He's handcuffed, shackled to sin because of his flesh. Because when Adam became just a man or a dead God, he passed that sinfulness to all mankind. I read the scripture for you. For us by one man sin entered into the world. One man. Okay? So, unless of course you receive the Christ, who is the only one who can free us from the slavery of sin and forgive us of its stain, you will always be a sinner. Yes, I know your question. You're saying, well, well, you you just say all, oh, even the Christians still sin, even the righteous still sin. Yes, but God the Father doesn't see your sin once you receive Jesus Christ. You see how wonderful that is? You see what a gift that is? As far as all humanity goes, we are all the same. We all, we all commit sin. But as far as God goes, as far as Jesus goes, those who receive him are like night and day. They are as far from the east as the east is from the west. Meaning, he, his blood, his sacrifice on the cross makes all the difference to the Father who only sees him, his blood. Who only sees his son when you receive him as Lord and Savior of your life. So even though you may still sin, and you will, God says, I will toss your sin into the sea of forgetfulness. I won't even see it. I won't even remember it. I won't hold your passings to your account. The only thing I'm interested in is whether or not you have received my son. Because that's the only antidote for your situation. Your sinful situation. So, through him we receive power to resist Satan's temptation. But because of the weakness of our flesh, we still sin. Even the believer, God, even the believer, God understands and forgives those who receive him. 
the Apostle Paul tells us of the great battle between his mind and his flesh. Now, this is the Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. This man understood what sin was about. He understood who Christ was and why he came. He explained it to us. I don't think there was anybody in that Bible other than Jesus himself who explained who he was better than Paul. And this is what he said, that he had a, he had a battle with sin. The sin. Romans 7 and 27, 22 to 23 says, this is what Paul speaking. Excuse me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. He's saying, I love, in my inner self, I love God's laws. Verse 23. He said, but I see another law at work in the members of my body. Waging war against the law of my mind. And making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. He's saying, listen, my mind knows better than to commit sin. He said, but my body lusts after things that I know I shouldn't partake in. Paul was a sinner. He was committing sin. And he's telling you right there. And see, that's why we should never condemn people like pastors when they sometimes make a sinful mistake. You don't condemn them. You are no different than him. Than him. He sinned. And don't think because someone becomes a pastor or a bishop or something that they're not going to sin anymore. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. The only thing is that you found out And guess what? You may punish him, remove him from the pulpit or whatever, and then we may receive him back later on, whatever. He hasn't stopped sinning. He's still sinning. Paul, the greatest bishop probably there ever was, says that he couldn't stop. He could not stop his flesh and his mind was waging war within him. Listen, this same battle is raging within every human being who was not in the grave. That means that over 7 billion people sin regularly on this planet. That's a lot of transgression being committed every single day God gives. And because of it, every single one of us has the sentence of death. The only solution is to receive the Savior, Jesus to Christ. Don't fool yourself. We all sin, though some don't think they do. Yeah, there's some people out there. That's why when people, you know, they become so ashamed when people find out that they did something. Well, you know, listen, you don't need to be so ashamed that you lose your faith because the person who's accusing you is also a sinner committing sin regularly just like you so the best thing for you to do is just admit you're wrong and ask God for forgiveness the Bible says it means just confess our sins one to another don't be ashamed to confess what you've done the quicker you confess it the quicker you can move on and they can move on and you can continue being their pastor or whatever you are to them and explain to them what Paul just said. Okay, we all sin. We all sin. We don't have control over this body. This body is a sinful flesh. The Bible says we, we sin because of the lust of our flesh. And as long as we are in this flesh, we will always sin. Doesn't matter who you are. I don't care. Listen, do not let, do not worship men. Do not admire men so much that you think they don't do wrong. Even because because they, they are your bishop and you, you they're so charismatic. Uh uh. Charisma is no deflection from sin. All men sin. Okay? Even the greatest, the only man that ever lived that did not sin was Jesus the Christ. Okay? 
Like I said, don't fool yourself. We all sin. Don't, though some don't think they do. First John 1 and 8 says, If we say we have no sin, First John 1 and 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And in that same passage, in verse 10, it says, And if we say we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar. And his word is not in us. Because he said, all sin and come short of his glory. And you don't have to do anything physically to commit sin. <laughs> Your mind alone can commit sin, according to God. You don't even have to do nothing outside of the body, outside of your mind. Just in your mind, you could commit sin. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 28, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And I'm sure that also means that any, any, man who looks, any woman who looks at a man with lustful intent, same thing, has already committed adultery with, her, with him in her heart. You see? Your mind can cause you to sin. You don't even have to do anything. Just your thought. You see why Jesus had to come? Because there isn't a man on earth who can live this life without sinning. We are all under the bondage of sin. And even after we come to Christ, we still sin. Because, like Paul said, sometimes our old nature of sin, which is still in our bodies, and since we are still in these bodies, until we die. That's why Jesus said he will give us a new body. He got to re um, um, relieve us of this body. We can't go into heaven with this body. Oftentimes we sin and are completely unaware of it. That's why we must pray without teasing the Bible says. We must always pray for forgiveness because we commit sin sometimes and we don't even know. The Bible says to be Angry at your own brother in your own house is a sin. You may even have a reason. But it's still a, it's a sin. <laughs> sin is a result of breaking one of God's commandments. Okay, that's the definition of sin right there. It's a result of breaking one of God's commandments. Okay. Jesus said that we should treat our neighbor as ourselves, meaning our neighbor, me, me, meaning anybody that we meet, we come in contact with, anybody. So if you love yourself, even if your brother does something in your house that offends you, you should still love him. You should still forgive him for it and let it go. Because you love yourself, right? So you should love him the same way. You wouldn't hold it against yourself forever. But don't hold it against him forever. So, like I said, sin is a result of the breaking of one of God's commandments, first given through Moses to the Israelites in the Old Testament, and since replaced by Christ in the New Testament. Meaning, God first gave laws through Moses. Right? Like I said, just said, sin is a result of breaking one of God's laws. So God first gave the law, through Moses. He gave Moses over 600 laws for the Israelites. And if they breached any of those laws, they would have committed sin. Okay? Jesus brought his own laws. Okay? And some of his laws were very similar to the laws that God gave us, gave the Israelites, sorry, not us, the Gentiles, the Israelites through Moses. When Jesus told the Israelites that they are no longer under the law, he wasn't speaking to us, the Gentiles. We are still under his law. He was telling them, you are no longer under the Mosaic law, which is the laws that God gave Moses. But he gave, they asked him which law should be followed, and he gave them seven laws. Okay? Like I said, he brought he brought his own rendition of with the laws that he wanted us to obey. And the, and the two most important ones he said is the two greatest is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy might, and thy strength, and have no other gods but him. And the second he said is just like the first, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Meaning, 
you can love God and don't love your neighbor. That's why he said it just like the first, the second is just like the first. He's saying if you love God, which is what the first law demands, then you will love your neighbor. He's saying, and if you love your neighbor, which is what the second law demands, he's saying you have to be in love with God. Because you cannot love your neighbor with, unless you love God. Because God is love. And the only correct way to love your neighbor is the way that God says we ought to love. So you can't say you love your neighbor and not love God. Because whatever that is you're feeling, that ain't love if you don't love God. Because God is love. It's in His Word. Okay? So, unintentional sin brought Jesus to the cross. Unintentional sin brought Jesus to the cross. It demanded a Savior because man has no power to control it. All humanity is born in bondage or slaves to sin because of Adam's error. Who was the first to commit unintentional sin? So you may be asking at this point, well, what error? What mistake you keep talking about in this thing? And now I'll be getting to the meat of this teaching. The mistake that caused sin. Before God created man, he decided on his destiny, and it would be to replicate his rulership through obedience to his divine guidance. But to have man do it by his own free will. Okay? God could have programmed him to man's mind to do whatever he wanted man to do. But if he did, then that person, then Adam would not have been like him. God has choices. He has free will to do whatever he wants. And he gave that ability to Adam. And he breathed into him and placed him self in Adam and made him a God. He gave him his own will. He wanted him to choose. With all the power that God has, he can do anything. He believes more and loves more when we do what he says by our own free will. He is more impressed to him, that's ultimate power. That's why he gives us all power when we do. Because he's so impressed that we would give our all to him like that. Even though we have the right to choose not to. That's why he offers us so much. You ever wonder why God offers us so much? To come to him? Because you have the right to decide not to. And sometimes it's difficult for you to understand how to or why you should. You know, the, 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 the folks in the Bible days had the evidence of their, they could see with their own eyes. They saw the miracles that Jesus did and the miracles that Moses did. All of them, they had evidence, of their visual evidence of the power of God. That's why Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Because... We haven't seen these things, and yet we believe in them. And this is why Jesus said, there has never been any prophet born of woman greater than John the Baptist. He said, but he who is least in the kingdom, meaning those who have received us, the modern day believer, on the believer since him. He said, those who have believed and never seen, these, he said, are blessed he said because they are greater than john because john didn't receive jesus before he died now he, he died believing in god okay but those who that's why i keep telling people modern the modern believer is greater than anybody in the Bible. Now, that's hard for some of you to, to believe, but Jesus said it. Jesus said there was none born of woman greater than the prophet John. 
So, but he who was least in the kingdom, meaning he who has received me as this Lord and Savior, is greater than he. So you, my friend, because you have received Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, is greater than anybody in the Bible. Jesus the King declared that. By his authority, he said that. So don't you put yourself down. Think of how grand your walk with God is, how important it is to him. How he looks at it when he compares it to those who were, uh, were back then as compared to you now. Like I said, he would sometimes he would speak to these those people. He would show them his mighty works. He would perform miracles, but you haven't seen any of these things, and yet you believe. You know how awesome that is to God. How much he treasures that. You are greater than anyone in that Bible before Jesus. Before Jesus. Because you are a kingdom man or woman. You have received the message of the kingdom. The message of grace. Congratulations. So... Like I said, before God created man, he decided on his destiny, and it would be to replicate his rulership through obedience to his divine guidance, but to have man do it by his own free will. In this way, the righteousness of God would be so in sync with man, it would literally, literally bring the atmosphere of heaven to earth. For man, a utopia. For God, a race of sons. Sons. God was after sons. Nothing would be inconceivable. Nothing impossible, a perfect, unimaginable relationship for all eternity. But it was interrupted by an unintentional act called sin. The act that stole man's immortality and plunged mankind into sin was in fact unintentional. Adam made a critical error. Remember he had two trees to choose from? He chose the wrong tree. Yes, Adam, even though Eve was deceived by Satan and committed the first sin, had Adam not listened to his wife, humankind would be immortal. Adam was given the right to decide the outcome of his and mankind's immortality, even though Eve had first disobeyed God and committed sin. How? How? Since they both ate of the forbidden fruit. Listen. God placed himself into the man, the male, at his creation. He only went to the ground once to make a human. A male and breathe himself into him he created male man for himself not for the woman you see this thing he made first which was a male he created for himself to do some great things through in the earth he wanted to have a race of sons of gods on the earth listen to me man if Adam didn't sin I believe we'd all been, we wouldn't even need airplanes right now. We'd be able to move through the air. Gravity would not be able to hold us. How, how can I say that? Well, did it hold Jesus? Didn't the Bible say that the disciples see him rising? And he didn't he make us like him? Listen, everything that we know of today would have been different. Completely different. We had dominion over the earth. We could tell the wind. Remember now, Jesus demonstrated this power. He spoke to the wind. We could have told the wind, pick us up and take us over there. Complete dominion over everything in the earth. The whole entire, the, the, the very... Uh, architecture of earth would not be what it is things like elevators and steps we wouldn't need those things we wouldn't need ground moving equipment and 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 cranes and stuff that build buildings we wouldn't need those things we could we would have been able to move things with our minds jesus demonstrated Everything that Jesus did was only him showing us what we had 
what, what was supposed to have the power to do and what we could have again if we received him that's all he was showing us we wouldn't need money printing machines remember Jesus went to the fish and took money out of the fish's mouth dominion the power of rulership that's what he made man <laughs> Like I said, ladies, you are God's gift to man. Yes, you are God's gift. No doubt about that. You are God's gift to us. You are the best thing God gave us, after himself, of course. But God made male man as a gift to himself. God did not make man for you. Now, I know that's hard for you to receive. But I got scripture to prove it to you. Okay? 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, and verses 8 to 9 says this. But I will have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. Notice it doesn't say the head of the woman is Christ. That's important. Keep listening. And the head of Christ is God. Meaning the Father. Right? Verse 8. For the man is not of the woman. Man didn't come from woman. But the woman of the man. The woman came out of the man. Okay? Verse 9. Neither. Listen to this now. So bring the home. The point I was making just now. Verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman. Uh-oh. You see that? But the woman for the man. That is very, very, very significant. That is the difference of night and day. Man wasn't created for woman. So who, who was he created for? A woman's, listen, a woman's purpose for existence, period, is a man. The only reason she exists, ladies, I'm sorry, you might take this the wrong way, but don't. Keep listening. Okay? Don't judge God on, on this yet. But your very existence is only for one reason. That is that you were created for the man. No other reason. No other reason. I just read it for you. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Woman was created for man. But man wasn't created for woman. Not just in marriage, it says man, notice it says man, not husband. And it says woman, not wife. Neither was man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. But in all things, period. So in all situations where there's a male and female, The, whether it's it's marriage, whether it's social, whether it's on the job, it doesn't matter. Business environment doesn't matter. The male is always supposed to be the head. Because she was made to assist him to be his helper. That's, see, that's where the world has gone astray. Listen, you see the mess the world is in today? When men were the definitive head of the family, and men were leading in all things, men were doing all the inventing, most of it, 99% of it, all the creating of things, all the designs, the architecture, the, the creation of all the things that we use today. They were respected in the home as the leader and the teacher of Godliness. But what has changed? 
what has changed? Women have now risen to where they feel they should be toe to toe with men in terms of leadership, rulership, responsi not, not responsibility to a, to a certain extent. Because that's what amazingly that's one of the things that they still don't want to accept when they're with a man. They still believe the man is the ultimate, ultimately responsible, but they still, but they want to rule head to head with him. But they won't accept all the responsibility. Ladies, you know I'm, I'm speaking the truth. When you're with a man, you still believe that he's supposed to take the lead in taking care of the family, right? But yet you still want to have as much say in it as him. Now, that, that, that's something, that configuration ain't right. If you feel like I'm supposed to have all uh, the, the head of the responsibility of the family, of our family, then how do you expect to have as much rulership as me? You have to let me rule. You can't rule head up with me. Now, I know, ladies, you, wanna, you say, yeah, but we should rule together. Yes, but there is still a role. There are still roles. The man is here, the woman is here. And I will give you some better understanding of that in a minute, okay? A woman's purpose for existence period is a man, not just in marriage, as it says, man, not husband, and, and, not woman, and woman, not wife, but in all things period. Misunderstanding of this configuration is causing a lot of relationship stress. A woman's true success in the things of God is determined by her understanding of this statement. She was created for man, not God. Woman was not created for God. Some of you believe you could bypass man to God. Well, you're misunderstanding your, your purpose. Ladies, please don't hate me for this. This is God saying this. Okay? Go with me on a journey, if you will. From everything God has allowed us to know about him, we receive a firm understanding of his identification with the male gender. Okay? Referring to himself as father, his offspring as son, and the Holy Spirit as he. This is God now. Man didn't do this. Okay? The proliferation of righteousness, righteousness in the earth was to happen through male headship with female subjection to the male. This is, this is in the word. Male headship and female subjection, these exact terms were, are in the Bible. But women today ain't, don't want to submit to no man. Well, okay, that's your right. You have a choice. God don't force himself on no one. And he's and men, you neither should you try to force yourself on your wife. If she doesn't want to submit to you, that then that's all right. You just remain what God asks you to be. And God will still take care of you. He'll deal with her. And ladies, he will deal with the man too. If he shirks his responsibility towards you, which is to take care of you. But ladies, you got to allow us to take care of you. Which means you got to submit to us. See, it's difficult for us to take care of you when you don't submit to us. Because then now you, 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 uh, non-submission, it takes over our minds because that's so important to us. Listen to me here. Yeah? There's nothing more tumultuous. There's nothing with more turmoil to a man when his mind is infiltrated by an unsubmissive wife. That's, that's a configuration that's hard for a man to live with. I'm telling you, you could throw him off his game altogether. That mess him right up. Are you wondering why he may be falling short and doing certain things? He may start. Some men just go turn to drugs and alcohol. Because they just don't want to deal with it. 
But they don't want to give up on their marriage either. But when you are disrespected by your wife, ladies, let me tell you, that to a man is the most demeaning feeling that he could ever get. There's no one can hurt a man more than his wife. I want y'all to know this, know the power that you have, ladies. See, because you think because God said that you should to submit to a man that, that that takes away power. That doesn't take away power from you. Because the power that you have within your husband for you is automatic. Because that's how we think as men. We love our wives. That's the command God gave us. And the person who we love, we are we give everything to them. Because all we need from her is our love. But then you ain't getting that from your wife. That's messed up. You don't want, even want to continue. Men walk away from their families for that. And I, I'm not giving that as an excuse, but I'm just giving you one of the reasons why. That's one of the most devastating things a man can experience to be unloved by his wife. To be, well, disrespected by his wife. Because your love is translated to respect. That's why God never told you to love your husband. He told you to respect your husband. When you love your husband, you respect him. And when you don't respect him, it's telling him, she doesn't love me. Why am I here? But men, don't you leave. Stay in there. Lean close, draw nearer to God. Let God help you. He will. I'm telling you, He will. He will. So, like I say, male headship and female subjection to the male. First, on earth with Adam who fell, then through the second Adam, Jesus the Christ, who came in the, in the same fashion. Oh, okay. He created his son, the Word, also known as Jesus on earth, as the first of creation, with the assignment of creation of earth and mankind, and heaven. The Word's instructions basically were to create more sons for the Father, like him, his brothers, many me's who would by free will demonstrate the kingdom of heaven through the kingdom of God on earth. God the Father would transfer of his essence to, his, to the first created earthly son, Adam, through his begotten son, the Word, we also know him as Jesus when he came to earth, gifting him with his divine ability, fueled only by obedience to him, by breathing into him. This creature would be a God like him, but outside of heaven, yet as powerful as earthly possible through granted dominion of earth. Okay? A supernatural immortal. A superman, if you wish. Even with his own kryptonite sin. You see, God breathed into Adam. He breathed into the thing. He, he, the Bible says he went to the dirt and he made this, he formed this thing. And then he breathed into it and the thing became alive. A living soul. Not physically alive. Now, he didn't breathe into Eve. Only into the male. Eve was alive, physically, but she wasn't alive in God. Now, obviously, the breathing into Adam was not to give him physical life, because before God made Adam, God made the animals. They were alive. He didn't breathe into them. He didn't breathe into Eve. She was alive. So breathing into Adam was not to give him physical life, but it was to make him like God. Let us make man in our image and likeness and let them have dominion over the earth. So, he had everything. He was a superman. 
with one caveat. He must never disobey God. Sin, which is which is brought about by disobedience to God's law. As long as he obeyed heaven's orders, he could never fail, even if he wanted to. As long as he obeyed God, Adam could not fall, even if he wanted to. But his physio physiological, his physiological, his body, and psychological makeup, his mind, demanded a companion for the multiplication of mankind on earth. To create a race of super beings, excuse me, he would need a helper, a woman. This was good, but dangerous. Why? Any being not made directly from God as a man was, like I said, he was, she wasn't breathed into, would require a different special kind of leading. Not a problem. That leading was placed in the man. As long as she followed her husband, she would be complete. If it wasn't husband, in the, in, in the Bible days, the Bible says that the woman submitted, she would have to first submit to her, her father. And then if her father died, she would submit to her brother. And even her brother-in-law. But she would always submit to a male. And then once she got married, she would submit to her husband. Okay? But when Eve was made, it was not with the Holy Spirit like Adam. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, but not spirit of my spirit. When God gave the Holy Spirit to indwell man directly in the Bible, it was by his breath. The only other time we saw this done was by the Christ, who is God, when he breathed on his disciples, again males, after the resurrection. John 20, 21-22 says this. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. It was the first act of God returning man to God in man's status, with the evidence of them being like him, through their performance of the acts of healing, raising the dead, and other acts that followed. They would be the first to experience the return of God in man. Those disciples were the first God's return of God's in man. They were God's once they received Jesus Christ as Lord. Once he breathed on them, when he came back from the resurrection, he came back as fully God. Adam, like any human being that receives the Christ, became a living soul after God breathed into him, not just a living human. The soul of a person is their true nature. Adam had the divine nature of God in him. Before the nature of sin, he was a God. Eve did not receive this gift from God. He did not breathe himself into her out of creation. Her soul was not created alive in God. She did not have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says any man that does not receive God's Spirit is already dead. So Eve was dead. Yes, she was dead. Not physically dead, but dead in her soul. And the Holy Spirit cannot be passed from human to human. So him, her being made from Adam's rib could not grant give her the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not pass from flesh to flesh or bone to bone. Eve could not receive the Holy Spirit out of creation unless God breathed him into her. Even Jesus could not give him until after his resurrection. Because before his death, he was God in man, just like we are, who receive him. After he was resurrected, he was fully God again. Okay? It was Adam's responsibility to teach his wife how to have a relationship with God like he did. She was to be the first convert of all humanity. She was to be the first person to be converted. Once she submitted to her husband and received his witness of God, she would be saved. All women are commanded to learn about God from their own husbands in this way. That has never changed. 1 Corinthians 14, 34-36 says, Let your women keep silent in the churches. For it is not permitted for them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience as also, also saith the law. Verse 35. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. 
Now, there are some who say that that is, was a rule that came about because of what was going on in the Corinthian church. That there were women who were out of a line, out of line, who were acting out of line. They were doing things that caused Paul to say that. But look at what Paul goes on to say. To show you that had nothing to do with what was going on in that church at that time. He says in verse 36, What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? Verse 37. He said, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So him saying that the women keep silent in the churches had nothing to do with his opinion or because the women were acting out of sorts. He said, this is a commandment. So women are not supposed to be speaking in churches still to this day. This is a commandment. And notice now, this is after Jesus. This is under grace. Because this is how it always was. It was meant to be. It's a command of God that only men teach in the church. This has nothing to do with what was going on in the church at the time. This is a universal statement that is, that is eternal. Because it was given under the grace of Jesus. Like I said, Jesus, God gave laws through Moses, right? And Jesus changed some of, removed us from those, removed them. He gave the laws to the Israelites. And Jesus removed them from under the law. But he still gave his own laws for us to follow. Okay? And this is one of them that he gave to one of his apostles. This is a commandment of the Lord Jesus, he's saying. Women are not to speak in the church. Now when he said women are not to speak, he's not saying that they can't, I guess, say anything at all. But he's saying they are not to speak, not to teach. That's what he's saying. They are commanded to be in obedience. And if they will learn anything, see, remember I said teach? If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. So I, well, I guess I got a backtrack there because it's saying it's a shame for them to speak at all. Or, well, you know, I still think it, this is saying to speak from a pulpit. She's not to preach. Because remember he also said that he does not allow a woman to teach a man. He also expressed that. All usurp authority, authority over him. So women are not allowed to teach men the word of God. Because from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, God always had Adam to teach Eve. And Jesus continued with that same example by only giving ministry to men. No different. So ladies, it's not that you can't do it, you know. It's, don't, it's just being obedient to God. That's all. To further emphasize, God's instructions concerning the forbidden tree was given only to Adam, who passed that knowledge on to his wife. Eve was not created as yet when he received those instructions from God. And if Eve committed any sin, it carried consequences only for her, because she was not divine. He didn't breathe into her. She was not a God. She was dead in her soul. But she would have become alive in her soul later if she received God. But what did she do? Before she had a chance to receive God, she received Satan. So what God did, God cursed her. For Adam, it was a different matter. He carried the divine nature of God with the ability to pass it or the nature of sin to his offspring. 
whichever way he went. He obviously told her about the forbidden fruit as her conversation with the serpent indicated. But her duty was to always follow him. Instead, she acted of her own desire. Her own mind, experiences, and understanding. She had no God in her. She had no connection with God. No man who is led by the Spirit of God intentionally disobeys God, which she did. Okay? The serpent knew the woman was not directly connected to God. He knew she was a weaker vessel. That's why he didn't approach Adam. But secondarily, by nature, through the man with a weaker bond that could be breached through her independent human nature. You see why independence, when it comes to God, independence is not a good thing? We may, we may cry for independence as a country, but when it comes to our personal lives, we should never be independent. We must always cling to our Creator. As, 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 like in the, the prodigal son, the son found himself back with his father, where he belonged, where God wants you to be, all of us to be. Thus God's instructions in 1 Peter 3 and 7. Likewise, ye husbands, talking about wives, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto a weaker vessel, and as being heirs together for the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. In other words, he's saying, teach your wife. You dwell with, deal with her according to the knowledge that God has given you. So while you're dwelling with her, you're teaching her. Okay? You're tutoring her under the things of God so that she can one day receive God. That's how we're supposed to do. That's why, men, we need to understand who we are here. Yeah? How important we are to God. As men lose their authority, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. You see it? As the image of the male authority is being squashed, the image of a... I don't know what that is. Another authority. This half male, half female nonsense is now pushing its head up, desiring to have authority. And ladies, I got to tell you, some of you are accomplices to this. I know these are your sons, but let me tell you, Jesus said, if you love father, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter over me, then you will have no place with me. So be careful. Be careful. So, when he says to deal with them according to knowledge, talking about the wife, he was meaning teach her the knowledge of God to strengthen her. Ladies, that also implies that if a man does not act toward you in accordance with God's instructions, he would not receive answers to his petitions or prayers. In this way, God places a bond on the man to ensure he carry out this instruction. When he told him that if you don't treat her as according to knowledge, your prayers could be hindered, that's what he meant. He's telling the man, listen, you won't get anything you ask of me if you don't treat your wife like I told you to. So God is the watching, taking care of you ladies. Your submission to your husband according to God will en encourage him to do, to also be, do things according to God. It encourages him. Listen, ain't nothing sweeter than a man who got a, a wife who loves him and treats him with respect and honor. Man, listen, all he wants to do is good for his family. He will give up. Every, he'll die fighting for his family and doing for his family. You know why men walk out? Because they feel like they're useless. They feel they have nothing to offer. Because no one receives, no one respects them. No one treats them with no, with gifts, shows them no love. No one, you know what I'm saying? They feel useless when they're not respected by the woman they love and they're with. Eve also did not receive life by the breath of God's spirit, but only physically by male man to whom she was subjective in her development. 
of submission to his leading would bring her to the knowledge of God. May a man but lead her to her understanding of her Creator. It was his job to teach her everything. That command still remains. A woman is also commanded to learn of all things from her husband, especially about God Himself, and to submit to Him as if she is doing service unto God Himself. This is what it says in Ephesians 5 and 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Some of you will say, well, he mean that we're supposed to treat him like how we treat God. Well, excuse me? The Bible says that Sarah called Abraham Lord. Yes, you are supposed to. Listen, you see, you see, it sounds crazy, right? But you got to understand. To you, your husband is supposed to be God's ambassador to you, God's representative to you. So, to him, all your blessing comes through the male to you, from God to the male to you. What does the Bible say? The man is the head of the woman, and the head of the man is Christ. So, Christ blesses the man with knowledge and understanding, and the man who's the head of the woman, passes that on to the woman. That's the configuration. So when you deal with your husband, you're supposed to deal with him as if you're dealing with God. Because he is God's representative to you. God will never bypass him to you. To get to you. Mm -mm. God always goes through the male in the relationship to get to the female. Because that's his configuration he created. And he says, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. He says, do, do it as if you submitting to God. That's what that is saying. I didn't say this. <laughs> this is in the Bible, okay? I know that's hard for some of you to receive, but that's why the gift is so great. Instead, Satan convinced Sarah... Satan, Satan convinced Eve, sorry, to obey him rather than her husband. Who told her about the command concerning the forbidden fruit and by this plunge herself into sin. But only herself. At that moment in time, the future of all life was in no danger as that sin was only hers. And she would die with it as long as it remained that way. Instead, she convinced God's gift to himself, the man, the container of a spirit. To do what she did, which caused a great unraveling of man's perfection. And here is the mistake. He, his decision to heed his wife's beckoning to eat the fruit brought sin into the world. And great chastisement deservedly from his creator. Who until then said nothing. God watched that whole thing unfold and said nothing. He was in control. God was up to something. He said that whole thing up. And he watched it unfold. And until the man ate, he didn't see anything that he wanted to stop. Because until the man ate, there was nothing that could hurt what he had put in place. So he said nothing. But as soon as the man ate, bam! Then he saw something he wanted to prevent. He said, now let's take this man out of this garden before he eats on the tree of life. Because here it is now. He listened to his wife when he made this great mistake. And God told him, he said, because you listened to your wife, now you're, the whole earth is cursed. But now I got to take you out of this garden before you eat from the tree of life and stay like this forever. Because like I say, that tree of life would have given eternal life that was Jesus in that tree. And if he had gotten eternal life in a broken state, he would never, God would never be able to bring him back from that. He would have had, he would have gone to hell and all mankind with him. Because we all came out of him. So, 
God said to him, why did you listen to your wife? Because you have, have the earth is now under a curse. You see, Adam did not disobey God, but instead, in that moment, mistakenly gave his headship, leadership, to his wife, to whom it did not belong. He didn't disobey. He allowed her to lead him. And God chastised him for that. That's why God cursed her and not him. God didn't curse him. Okay? Go back and read your Bible. God never cursed Adam. He cursed the ground. Meaning, as a matter of fact, he didn't even curse the ground. He said, because you have listened to your wife, the earth is now under a curse. God didn't curse the earth. God told, was telling them, now you have lost your dominion. Now the earth is under a curse now because it ain't, it's not going to listen to you no more. Because now the one in you who have has dominion over the earth that the earth has to obey is was the God in you but now that you have eaten this fruit that I said not to eat even though you didn't intentionally do it you still committed this transgression the God in you has now removed been removed by the Holy Spirit that I breathe into you leaving you so now the earth is cursed. So now you got to go to it and work it now to produce fruit. Now, think about this now. If the earth is cursed and it produces all this sustenance that we have, the fruits, the vegetables, everything as a matter of fact that is alive came from the earth. Even the fish. Okay? The Bible tells us that. Um, and it's cursed. Can you imagine what it would have been like today if it wasn't? God. Like I said, but that is why he wasn't cursed like his wife. But the mistake was made. He broke the law and lost his dominion over the earth. Okay, God cursed the ground for Adam's sake. God, but I, I, God didn't curse the ground. The ground was cursed for Adam's sake. But he didn't curse Adam, only Eve, because he didn't disobey. She did. He made a mistake. He trusted her, who was not led of God, and God chastised him, chastised him for it. Because he was telling him, when he said then, why? Because you have listened to your wife. He was telling him, you know your wife does not have me in her. It's your job to lead her to me, so that she would be the first convert. Why are you letting her lead you? In this garden, you know there's something that you shouldn't touch. So you shouldn't allow her to bring you anything out of this garden without you first finding out where she got it from. But he didn't. So that was, the, that was the mistake. Man, because of sin, became separated from God, and the earth became separated from man for the same sin. You see? When, God became, when man became separated from God, he also became separated. He, the God left him when he became separated from God. That, that's what death means. And God told him he shall surely die if he ate the fruit. So when that happened, then because God left him, he no longer was a God. So the earth left him too. The earth separated from him. And that's what God meant when he said the earth is now under curse. Because now you can't command it to do anything. Okay? He committed an unimaginable error that led all mankind into the origin, uh, origin of the nature of sin. You see, as long as he did not eat, mankind was safe. Immortality would reign and humanity would remain sinless. But for the woman who was already dead in her soul anyway. And would eventually die physically because of her transgression. Eve would have, Eve would have died alone in her sin. And listen... Adam could still produce sinless offspring through her sinful womb as long as he remained sinless. As long as he obeyed, the Holy Spirit would always indwell him. He would have remained a God. God would have remained in him and keep him and his seed righteous. How? The second Adam, Jesus demonstrated this very thing when he was born of a sinful womb but remained sinless. Conceived by the Holy Spirit that conceived his forerunner in the flesh, the voice Adam. Same way. God conceived Adam by breathing the Holy Spirit into him, remember? And making him a living soul. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit too. 
And Jesus came through a sinful womb. Mary, his mother Mary. See, the things of God, as long as the Holy Spirit is present, he overcomes every situation. As long as we remain in God, we can overcome anything. That's why Jesus could come through a sinful womb and not have sin. Even though all men that come through the wombs of other humans, women, are born in sin. Jesus was not born in sin. And Adam would have been able to do the same thing with his children through Eve's sinful womb. Because he had the Holy Spirit in him. See? This is the legacy of the male man, conceived as the progenitor of a holy race whose divine existence could only be interrupted by him, either by error or intent. This time in error. He listened to his wife, and God knew that he would. Be, that he would. Nevertheless, he had given the choice to choose good or evil, even by error, because he was like God. So he had to be given that choice. And because of that one mistake, Calvary was necessary. An unintentional act of sin brought God to his creation earth. Unintentionality was the reason why he came. And thank God that it was unintentional. Because if Adam had disobeyed God and made his own decision to eat that fruit consciously and made a conscious decision to disobey God, mankind would have been forever lost. God would have had to destroy them and start over. And I don't know if he would. Because if a man who has the Holy Spirit living in him could intentionally disobey God, he can never be returned, the Bible says. Never be returned. And, 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 man, and men have committed sin in this way ever since, unintentionally. Almost every sin committed by man is unintentional, a result of the bondage of the nature of sin. Only a man who has been set free through the only way which is Christ can commit intentional sin. That's why he can never be returned. Even though, though even the righteous still commit sin unintentionally. This is why grace is offered even to the worst of us. We are all slaves to sin and cannot help ourselves. The Bible says the man who commits sin unintentionally after tasting of the grace of God by receiving salvation cannot be saved again. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, verse 5, and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, verse 6, if they shall fall away, if they backslide, to renew them again to repentance. They can't get those things again. They can't get the Holy Ghost they can't get the heavenly gift of grace. They can't, if they've tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, they cannot, and if they fall away, they can't renew them again. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So only the, the, only the man who is in Christ can commit intentional sin. You see, because... We who are in Christ, we sin, but our sin is still unintentional because of our old nature. I, t I just read for you what Paul said about the war that's waging between his mind and his flesh. And Paul is the great, one of the greatest teachers in the Bible. He still had sin to deal with every day. He couldn't stop himself. He said he finds himself in Romans doing what he should not do. And even though he knows he should not do it, he still does it. He can't help it. It's his old nature, he said. The replication of Adam's transgression has been passed down from him to all mankind as a bondage that can only be destroyed by the blood of Jesus. If it was both by Adam and Eve, the Bible would not say one man. Remember Romans 5 and 2, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. This could not be broken unless the required payment could be made by someone not of sinful earth. And that is Jesus Christ. For well, the wages of sin is, Romans 6 and 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Jesus Christ came and paid the wage for all mankind, which was death. Unfortunately, most of the world has not believed and thus received it. And even those who, some, a lot of people who believe, believe in the wrong doctrine, through the wrong teaching. And so they really, I'm not sure if you could really say they say. Remember Jesus said, there are many saying Jesus, Jesus, but I don't know them. You see, you have to submit yourself to God so that God could give you the truth. You can't learn about God through other people. Yes, I'm teaching here right now, but what I'm saying is something that you not, you don't take just on my word. You check the stuff that I've said. I'm only guiding you to the Bible so that you can go and confirm what I'm saying to you, teaching, uh, teaching. Because Jesus is the teacher. I'm not the teacher. I'm only repeating what Jesus said. Now, you see all these scriptures I'm giving you? You are to confirm these things that I'm, te that I'm saying to you, teaching you. Not just take my word. Okay? Sin rages on unchecked. Continuous proliferation pushing the world farther away from alignment with its creator, bringing the world closer to judgment. The so-called church commits as much sin as the world, losing its ability to affect change towards righteousness as foretold by the Bible. It has lost its seasoning, so to speak. The Bible says this about the church, Matthew 5 and 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and walked on by people. He's saying, listen, church, you are the ones who, <coughs> excuse me, you are the ones who I have sent forth to teach the world about righteousness, about salvation, about me. He said, if you don't understand it or haven't done what is necessary for you to get the, con the correct understanding and the correct interpretation of it, and then are passing it, passing on incorrect interpretation, then you are no good to me, he said. The only thing you're good for, he says, is to, is to be trampled on and thrown out, thrown out and, and trampled on by people. And that's exactly what's happening to the church today. The church is being trampled on now because... People can't tell if the church is serious. It's so much compromise and so much incorrect doctrine that contradicts itself. You don't know, you know, it's hard for people to receive the church now, but I'm telling you. The world loves sin. It is more comfortable with it than ever before because there is no opposition. Because people have been compromised by lust for personal gain. Sin has become more frequent than any than probably any activity on earth by humans, and for this reason, at the end of the age, the end of the age will come, says God. I mean, how can we say homosexual sexuality is an abomination when the church knowingly accepts them now as ministers? Knowingly how can we say thou shalt not steal when pastors steal in the church money given for God's work and enrich themselves within big houses, three-story houses? How can we condemn adultery when leaders have extramarital affairs with other church members? My God, priests are raping our sons and daughters, sexually assaulting our children, and we turn a blind eye, we act like we just uh, we allow their, 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 their head office to just send them someplace else and don't demand that they be cut off. We, we see that they send in these priests other places. We know, and we don't know nothing about it. We say nothing. We accept it, and we stay right there. But we're more concerned with the stakeout and the supper ticket than the abuse of our own children. More concerned about the building than the actual church, which is the people. Sin has become more frequent than probably any activity on earth by humans. The good news is that there's an antidote for sin. His name is Jesus the Christ. He's just waiting for us to take the message of his kingdom to all men, then the end will come. Matthew 24 and 14 says, This good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, 
and then the end will come. You see, we the church must go as he commanded so that the whole earth will have knowledge of him to make a decision for themselves. See, he's saying he won't come until the whole world knows about him and has a chance to choose. That's how loving God is. You know? That's why he hasn't come yet. Because there are still places on the earth that have not heard of him. Now that might seem shocking to you, but you you barely you 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 may have heard the name Buddha, but you don't know who in any detail who Buddha is. People may have heard the name Jesus, but they don't know who he is. They don't truly know who he is. It takes real study to understand who Jesus was. Is you might have heard of some Hindu gods, but you don't know nothing about them. The same way they don't know nothing about Jesus. And the same way Buddhist people in many parts of the world don't know nothing about Jesus. They know but Buddha. The Hindu people know but Hindu. The Baha'i people know but Baha'i. You see? So that's why Jesus said, I gotta, if you gotta go. Take the message to the world. So that every man could know it. And then he says, I can ask them why they didn't receive me. They'll have a chance to receive me. I can't come until everybody, it's, it's being taught everywhere. So, we the church must go as he commanded so that the whole earth will have knowledge of him to make a decision for themselves. Life or death, good or evil. Remember, he's the same thing he's saying to Adam and Eve and to the Israelites from the beginning of the Bible. The tree of life and the tree of death, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Same thing. Life and death, good and evil. And he gave Adam the choice to choose. And Adam mistakenly ate from the tree of evil. The knowledge of good and evil, which was the tree of death. It's a decision to choose who we will serve, God or Satan. Every man will be judged according to his decision because all mankind will have knowledge of the truth to make that decision if we go. Well, I, I'm going. This is how I go. And when I get a chance, I'll go wherever I'm invited, I'll go. And you must also believe that. That is God's most important commandment to us after receiving him. He says, go. I can't come if you don't go. You might say, well, that can't be. You can't tell me if we don't go and take this message, Jesus ain't coming. That's what he said. He said, Matthew 24 and 14, the, this good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So if, the, if it's not preached to the whole world, the end ain't going to come. That means we will, we, will get into, we will keep progressing into a state of total desolation. It will become so bad. We got to go. We got to go. So that brings us to the end of our teaching for today. I know it was long, but it's it's worth it. See, listen, listen. Knowledge of God takes time. It, it takes devotion. You got to be willing to. You know, I always, I always. I, one of the things that 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 really gets on my nerve with the church, with preachers, is when they start saying things like, "Oh, I know, that we get we run out of time." And this and that, and uh, are we done gone? Listen. Oh, give me just give me another ten minutes. Listen, it is necessary for you to take ten minutes, another half hour. Go ahead. That's what they come to the church for. If they only come to get something to say they've been to church, then they might as well leave. Give people the knowledge of the truth, as long as it takes. Let them sit there and hear it. It'll save 
their lives. I know it saved mine. I had a pastor who used to preach for a long time. <laughs> oh yeah, but guess what? Man, that was the most interesting three, four hours ever for me. I learned a lot. I know many others did too. Because the church, people didn't leave. That's when the teaching is really good and right. The word displaying the evidence. Okay. So I thank you. And uh, like I said, don't forget to share. Please share. It'll be on my YouTube channel, on this posted on this page, and on my Twitter account. And hey, we're going to have another great one next week. Next week is going to be interesting. I'm going to try to put together a teaching on one save, always save theory. Is it true or not? Okay, so that's going to be real interesting next week. So, enjoy your day. Have a great one. God bless you. Be careful out there. Satan is busy. Okay? I love you all, and I will see you all next week. Bye-bye.